unless you guys hate technology, that's what it is. <laughs> okay, so very happy to have uh, Tim Burns from Swansea. So he did his uh, PhD in uh, Oxford with Frank Close. Uh, and he did a post at Rome, and uh, also worked with Penn at uh, Durham. Joined Swansea University as a teaching fellow, and has now been promoted to be a regular academic staff member. So we're very happy to have him come and give us a talk about uh, Pentawalks. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Craig, and thanks for the invitation to come and talk to you about uh, about these newly newly discovered or updated discoveries at LHCB about these so-called pentaquark states. Uh, so, actually, how long do I have, Craig? When should I finish? Ten to ten to five, or ten to five? Okay. Uh, so. So this is going to be quite a physics-y talk. It's not very technical, so maybe it'll be a little bit of a change of change of pace for some of the talks you're you're used to. But uh, let's see. I'll begin with just some remarks about about conventional hadrons and exotic hadrons. Beginning with the very obvious that we have this picture, which is simplistic but but effective, of describing baryons as bound states of three quarks and mesons as bound states of a quark and an antiquark. And I just want to remind you that this picture developed because hadrons, roughly speaking, were able to be organized into these multiplets. It was, it was filling out these multiplets and predicting the states that were missing and subsequently observed. It was, it was these, these analysis of these patterns that led to the understanding of the of the SU3 group of flavor and then SU3 of color, ultimately quantum chromodynamics and so on. So essentially it's, it's patterns are the key to understanding hadronic physics and it's historically the absence of states outside of this pattern that really led to the development of these theories. So I suppose the theme of this talk is well, starting first from the observation that there are now, there is now compelling evidence for states which are outside of these multiplets. And the second thing is to say that in order to understand these new states, we again are going to have to study patterns. And so in that sense, it's very fortunate now that we have LHCB as an experiment which is very effectively studying and measuring the properties of these unusual particles. So from a theoretical perspective, the types of hadrons that belong outside this, this um, simplistic or simple picture uh, fall into various categories. One of them is hybrid mesons. This is my cartoon of a hybrid meson, or you can also have hybrid baryons. The idea with these is that the gluonic degrees of freedoms, freedoms so the gluons that bind the quarks are not uh, sort of inert. They're, that um, manifest as excited flux tubes. I won't be talking about those in great detail today. I will talk a little bit about an alternative type of exotic hadron, which is called a multi-quark, which is essentially where you have more, more quarks, not just three quarks for a barrel or a quark anti-quark from a meson. And the essence of the compact multi-quark approach is that you build up these more complicated configurations by looking at pairwise interactions between the constituents. A different picture, which will be the subject of my talk, also involves larger numbers of quarks, but the effective degrees of freedom are not really quarks as such, they're, they're hadrons. So, for example, here we would have a four quark state, or two quarks and two antiquarks, but this is my cartoon is supposed to give the idea that we think of this as a composite of two mesons rather than as a composite of four quarks. It's a question of what are the relevant degrees of freedom. And a competing interpretation, which is, which is really a less exotic interpretation than all of these, is a so-called threshold effect. And this, this is really just a cartoon to, to indicate that, to indicate a loop of hadrons, this is supposed to be something like a Feynman diagram, where you have hadrons in a loop recoupling to produce other hadrons. And when the energy denominator for the hadrons in this loop becomes very large, you can get enhancements in experiment. And so sometimes what appears to be a new particle in the experiment can actually be explained as some kind of threshold effect. 
I'm going to be talking mainly about, about this type of thing today. So a hadronic molecule, the best way to think about it really is as a generalization of, of the deuteron. So the deuteron is an isospin zero spin one state of a proton and a nu neutron. It's the simplest possible nucleus. It has a binding energy of about 2 MeV, so it means it's 2 MeV below the threshold for a proton and a neutron. And this thing was understood long before QCD. It was understood as the bound state of a proton and a neutron. So there are six quarks there, but we think about the deuteron in this type of picture, molecular type of picture, rather than as a multi-quark type of picture. Or at least let's say that is the most direct way to understand the properties of the deuteron. So uh, I'm going to be advocating a model today for these new observations at the LHCB, which is similar in spirit to this. And if you think about it, it you, so what I'm going to be talking about are, are, are generalizations of the deuteron, but with hadrons, with heavier hadrons, hadrons with heavy quarks in them. And it's very natural, actually, that such things should exist, because if you compare to the deuteron, so there are a couple of factors that determine whether or not you could have a bound state. Okay? In, any, in any kind of potential problem, bound states form when you have a competition between the attractive potential and a, and a, and a kinetic energy term. So if you make the hadrons heavier, the kinetic energy term decreases. So if the potential were the same, it would be easier to make a bound state. Okay, now the potentials are actually not the same, okay, but they're related, and they're related in quite a straightforward way. So it's very natural that, that we could imagine the existence of, of generalizations of the deuteron, but with heavy hadrons. So I'm just going, this is almost everything I'm going to say about the literature. I'm not going to be pedantic about explaining everything that's ever been done here, but there have been a lot of papers written on hadronic molecules going back to the 1970s. Um, there's been a lot of effort focused on ha general molecules where the constituents are D mesons and anti D mesons, and that's because of the discovery of this um, X3872 particle about 15 years ago, a state which is exactly almost at the threshold for for d a D star and a D meson. But there have also been papers with other combinations of hadrons, sigma Cs and nucleons, nucleons and B mesons, and so on. So let me first just tell you about these experimental discoveries, what's provoked this work. So uh, there's really two things, something that happened in 2015, and there's What's happened since then, much more recently this year. So the LHCB experiment did a, an amplitude analysis of the three-body decay of the lambda B baryon, decaying to J psi, proton, and a kaon. Okay, so this is a weak decay. A bottom quark turns into a charm quark, emitting a W, which produces a strange quark and an anti-charm. Okay, and then we have an up anti up popping out of the vacuum to get our overall final state with J psi, proton, and a kaon. What is very interesting is that they discovered these two states. So looking at the, the, the different combinations of these three final states, um, they find states which effectively, resonant states which decay into J psi and a proton. So these states are something, they have the flavor of a proton, okay, but hidden charm. They decay to J psi and proton. So these are the quark constituents of a J psi. Sorry, this is the J psi, charm anti charm, and this is the quark constituents of a proton. That's why they're called pentaquarks, but that's a slightly misleading name because that's normally associated with one particular type of interpretation. So it would have, I would have preferred it if they called these things uh, super excited protons or something because it has the flavor of a proton. And conventionally in hadron physics, you describe states by their flavor and quantum number quantum numbers spin and parity. So these things have the flavor, at least, of a proton, because the charm content is, is hidden. But what's so unusual about these is, so, so if they've got the flavor of the nucleon, what's so unusual about them? Well, conventional nucleons sort of, the, the spectrum of conventional nucleons peters out at around 
two Jev. Okay, these things have got mass four and a half Jev. Okay, and the fact that they decay to Jev. So that's an indication that somehow there's this hidden charm content in their wave function. So this is this is a, a, a shot of their analysis. It's a Dalitz plot analysis, for those of you who are familiar with this. And uh, so this takes this three-body decay here and organizes the particles into pairs, different pairs, and then looks at the invariant masses of the pairs. So along this axis, you have states which would decay into a kaon and a proton. And this, dense, this large density of states here is indicative of excited lambda-type hadrons, lambda hadrons being ones which decay into kaons and protons. What you can't you can barely see to the naked eye is this slight increase in density of states over here, and this is the exotic J psi proton uh, so-called pentaquark state. And you can't really, really see that with the naked eye, but if they, they do a full statistical analysis of this data, uh, and and now I'm looking at, so I'm now taking, if you like, a, a, a slice of the invariant mass of the J psi proton spectrum um, and so we're looking at the invariant mass of the J psi and the proton and this is their raw data here I can't remember if black or red is data but one is the data and one is an amplitude model that they use to fit the data and you can see that there's a very impressive uh, looking peak here so it looks like there's something here and so this in their fit becomes what they call the PC 4450 it's a very narrow meaning lo long lived uh, resonant state and another state which you can't really see with the naked eye but is there when they do their analysis represented by this purple blob here this is a lower mass state PC 4380 so that's a lighter and broader state so this is a very impressive analysis that they've done here this is a full amplitude analysis so this is more than the conventional sort of bump hunting approach to hadron physics where you just look at bumps in the invariant mass. So they've done a full amplitude analysis of the three body decays. So these things are, are real. And then just this year, uh, only a month or so ago, they updated their results. They've now looked at 10 times more data. And this is the same plot I showed you before. And what was a very faint line is now a quite striking um, evidence for an excess of events uh, in the same mass region. And this is the equivalent Sorry. plot, yeah. Was there a second line? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. this one, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well spotted, yeah. yeah. So, exactly, you should do experimental physics. <laughs> Take that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, <coughs> Exactly. Um, so let me just, yeah. Um, so this is the same plot as I showed you before, but now with this new data, with 10 times more data. So this peak here, that was one peak, has now been resolved into two different peaks. So what was one particle has now become two particles. So the heaviest state, the 4450, has now become these two particles. The, lo the lower mass broad state is not visible in their data. I'll comment on that in a second. But they say they see this new peak here at a lower still mass. So this is a different analysis. They've got a lot more data, so they haven't done a full amplitude analysis of this data, which just, I think, because it's very difficult and time-consuming, they are going to do it. What they've done simply is exploit the fact that they've just got a lot more data. So by brute force, they just look at the invariant mass and they see these very clear peaks, which they weren't able to see before. Um, so here we have the situation is that the heavier, mass, the heavier particle is now split into two particles. The broader lower mass particle is not visible here, but it's not to say it doesn't exist. They're just not sensitive to it. And then there's a new particle here, which is which has popped up. So that's the experimental situation. And so all of these things decay into J psi protons. So they're all exotic for the same sort of reason that I described before. So when new things get discovered in, in hadron physics, which look like they have more than the conventional uh, baryon or meson quark content, the natural thing to do is 
start looking, asking the question, are there any nearby, are there any nearby two body thresholds for hadrons with the same quantum numbers? Because that could then be indicative of some sort of deuteron-like state or some sort of threshold effect. So I'll show, you, I'll show you here a plot which I'm going to keep coming back to throughout the talk, and the vertical scale will become, the logic behind the vertical scale will become apparent in a second. So this is the situation in, in 2015. We have these two states, the heavy narrow one and the light broad one. And then after this recent, ah, so sorry, yes, when, that, when, when these two states were initially discovered, uh, Russia people observed that they're very close to thresholds, for two particle combinations with the same quantum numbers. Sigma C star D, Sigma C D star, and Lambda C 1 D. So these are the thresholds for those two particle combinations. I'll remind you in a second what these particles are for those of you who don't think about these things very often. You may have forgotten. So that, there's a rush of papers to explain these particles as bound states, as molecular type states of these particles. Then, since the update from LHCb, this heavier state splits into two now, and then we have this additional lighter state, and no new information about this one. So then LHCb themselves made the observation, knowing already we have the proximity of thresholds for the previously observed state, they made the observation themselves that this new state is also very close to a two-body threshold. So it all sort of points towards some sort of hadronic degrees of freedom. The fact that the masses of these states are so close to the thresholds suggests either a molecular type interpretation or a threshold effect. Because the alternative possibility, the so-called compact pentaquark scenario I mentioned at the start, in that scenario there is no reason why the mass of a particle would be related to these thresholds. It would just be a coincidence. Okay? Whereas in the molecular type scenario, it's extremely natural. Uh, let me just remind you, for those of you who don't, who don't think about these things all the time, what these particles are that I'm talking about. So the sigma C and sigma C star baryons are up-down charm baryons. Okay, these have got uh, isospin 1 and total spin 1 half or 3 halves. Okay, and the D and D star, <coughs> well really they should be D bars, okay, but anyway, um, these are up anti-charm particles with either spin one half and spin naught or spin one. Okay, so then the, the, the masses of various combinations of these particles combine to give uh, the threshold values I've shown you. Okay, the lambda C1, yeah. I, I may be mistaken, sure. but in the previous plot there were three peaks. Uh, yeah, there were three, yeah, exactly, thanks. There were three peaks, just because the new analysis is not sensitive to this state. So in the new analysis, they don't see this state, which but is not to say... It's from the previous plot. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it's just because of the method. They're only sensitive, because they're doing a more brute force analysis, they're only sensitive to narrow peaks. This one's broad, so when you're doing such a brute force kind of crude analysis, you don't see it. Yeah. Um, this guy I'll tell you about in a second. So, so it looks like uh, it's very tempting to say, okay, these things are hadronic molecules. And that's a good line of thought, but if you're going to start saying that these states are molecular type states made of these constituents, then it's easy to say that after the fact, but what about all the other possible combinations of states? Where are they and why are they not seen? So if I'm going to consider sigma c's and sigma c stars and d's and d stars, I better consider all the possible combinations, right? And that's going to be really the theme of my talk. Um, is it natural, when you look at all the possibilities, that you would get states at these thresholds and not at all of the other ones? That's really the theme of my talk. So. What are these extra states I've introduced here? So the lambda C, the lambda C is also a UDC state. It's got eyes of spin zero and spin a half. 
Okay, so all of these states that I've, that I've written down here are S-wave states. They've got zero orbital angular momentum. So the spin and parity quantum numbers, they're all negative parity states. So they're all positive parity states for the baryons and negative parity states for the mesons. There's this one other, this, these other pair, this other pair here, the lambda C1, that's really what's normally known as lambda C2595, and lambda C3 is lambda C2625. So these guys are just like the lambdas, except they've got an orbital excitation. So the bottom line is, their spin parity is opposite to the corresponding spin parity of this lambda. And that will, that will have some relevance later on. Spin and parity being key quantum numbers that experimentalists can, can observe. So, if I'm going to consider all the possibilities, I need to not only consider what combinations of particles, but also what spin parities they can combine into. So, for example, a lambda c and a d, as a, as a half plus and a naught minus, can only combine to give spin parity half minus. If I take a lambda c and a d star instead, then combining the half, the half plus with a one minus, I can make half minus three halves minus, and so on. So I actually have a lot of possibilities to consider here. And my logic is going to be to just ask the question, is it natural uh, that we see states at these thresholds? And if so, can we predict what the spin and parity of them are? Okay, now in the previous analysis from LHCB, they made some measurements of the spin parity, and they were not fixed, but they narrowed the possibilities. But since this new analysis, uh, the point of view of LHCB is their previous analysis for spin parity is now obsolete because they were assuming two particles. They now have more, and therefore the underlying assumptions of their fit model are no longer appropriate. So the, the current status quo is there is no information about the spin and parity of these particles. <coughs> so, so hadronic molecules, so now comes this sort of model aspect. So how do we look for bound states with hadronic molecules? So there are two approaches which are typically used in the literature. Uh, one is motivated by heavy quark and chiral symmetry, and the other is a more primitive approach which is using the quark model. So when we're looking for bound states, hadronic molecules, we, we consider, at least in this talk, and what most of the literature considers, is that the binding force is due to the exchange of pions, because pions are the lightest particle, and they couple strongly to these open flavor hadrons. So that's how we explain the deuteron in the zeroth order approximation. So we do the same thing for heavy hadrons. We consider the pion so exchange what, what to be the- What is the phrase open flavor? Sorry? Open ah, open flavor means states like this um, with, uh, with, a, with a flavored quark, like a charm quark in it, okay. as opposed to a closed flavor. So an open flavor combination would be, that is open flavor and that is open flavor, but if I organize the quarks in a different way, that would be called closed flavor because the, the charm quarks are hidden. Okay. okay, it's just a, small, a minor point. But you see, in this combination, there is no exchange of pylons between, between these particles because, because of the flavour. Because this has got isospin zero, it can't couple to a pylon. Okay, but because both of these particles have got isospin, they can couple to pylons. Okay. So we build everything up from the vertex. So in nuclear physics, you have an n to n pi vertex and it has the structure of a coupling constant, and then we have a Pauli matrix corresponding to, which acts on the spin degrees of freedom. Q is the momentum of the pion, and then the tau matrix is the generalization of the, of the, of the, Pauli, mat of, of the uh, Pauli matrix, to, but to isospin. So we have a tau matrix dotted into pi. So this is a pion field, which contains the three different charged pions. So in the heavy quark symmetry approach, you basically generalize this. You replace the coupling constant with a different coupling constant, considering, for example, sigma c going to sigma c pion. 
The spin of the sigma c is a half, so the spin dependent term remains the same, but the iso spin dependence changes, so we have a different operator here. Um, similarly, if you consider a d star meson, you replace the coupling constant. Now the iso spin dependence is the same because it's an iso spin half particle, but the spin dependence is different because this is a vector particle. So we have a different operator here. But the same basic structure is there. But in this approach, you have different coupling constants for all the different vertices, although there are relations among them imposed by heavy quark symmetry. In the quark model instead, you have less freedom because everything is built up in the quark model from the same vertex, which is a quark pion vertex as opposed to a hadron pion vertex, it's built up uh, from quark pion vertices. So in the, in the case of the nucleon to nucleon pion, <coughs> the vertex is due to the sum over three of these vertices. Okay, if you consider a sigma c, so a sigma c is a, has got two light quarks and a charm quark, the pions only couple to the light quark, so we get two diagrams here. So we have two terms of the same form, but the same coupling constant. And finally, for the D-flavoured mesons, we have a single light quark, so we get a single diagram. The bottom line is two things. Firstly, in the quark model, you have just one coupling constant, which fixes everything. Why is that? Why is it universal? It's universal just because every vertex is just a quark pion vertex so it's the same vertex everywhere the difference is just that the quarks are embedded into different hadrons we could depend on could, could it depend on whether it's a u d whatever quark? uh the light quark flavor maybe well so i would we work typically in the limit of isospin symmetry in which case up and down are the same but one can one can make corrections for that but i don't think they're very significant so the second big difference is, sorry, the second, <coughs> let's say, important common feature is that if you stare at these things for a little while, you see they've both got the same basic form. The heavy quark approach and the, and the quark model approach have got the same basic form. We have a coupling constant, a spin vector dotted with a, a, a momentum vector, and then a flavor vector dotted with a pion field. Anyway, that's just a small technical point which I use to do the calculation. I solve this problem and can then map it to either of these approaches. So the message, which is not widely appreciated in the literature, is that these two approaches, the heavy quark symmetry approach and the quark model, are, at the end of the day, they're the same. Apart from a small amount of extra freedom in this approach due to the coupling constants. So we do the calculation combining one of these baryons with one of these mesons. Because we've got two light quarks here, we've got to sum over two diagrams. Combine the sigmas and the lambdas with the d's and the d stars. So the potential experienced by this hadron pair is obtained from the scattering amplitude in momentum space, your Fourier transform to position space. And what you find is that this pion exchange couples different combinations of hadrons. So you mix, for example, lambda c d with sigma c d star. Okay, that can happen because you can have a a lambda c here coupling to a sigma c, for example, and a d coupling to a d star. And what can also happen is that the, the quantum numbers of the combination can change. Okay, so I'm using atomic notation here. Doesn't, the details are not important except to say that in this case that you have a total spin one half in S wave, zero orbital angular momentum, and then total angular momentum half. And here you have total spin three halves coupling in D wave to make angular momentum half. So in principle, all of these different combinations get mixed up by this potential, but the pattern of which states bind is really driven by diagonal blocks of, of identical particles. In other words, we ignore the fact that different particles mix here, but we allow for the fact that they can go into different angular momentum states. Okay, it just makes life simpler, and it's a good first approximation. So, in doing this kind of calculation, the first observation is that lambda c cannot couple to lambda c plus a pion, because lambda c has got isospin 0, and a, and a pion has got isospin 1. So a vertex involving two lambda c's is forbidden, 
and a vertex involving 2D particles is also forbidden, in this case because of the spin parity. So in this, in this first approximation, so to come back to this, this big diagram here, what we have is the possibility that all of these different thresholds can be coupled, and in principle one would then have a large matrix problem to solve for a given uh, spin parity quantum numbers. All of these states get mixed up. Okay. But to a first approximation, we can say, let's ignore the fact that the particles mix and just consider fixed combinations of particles, but allow there to be different angular momentum states. And if I do that by the rationale I just described, diagrams involving lambda Cs, Ds, okay, like these ones, will, will have no potential because the lambda C cannot couple to a lambda C and a pion. A D can't couple to a D and a pion. So in this approximation, I eliminate all of a sudden a lot of possibilities. Okay, all that's left are these combinations. Okay, so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to be looking specifically at those combinations. This is a choice for your model. In the end, uh, uh, it's, no, it's not. Well, it's not a model choice. It's a motivated. It, it's it, it's an approximation, but it's not a. It's not a. It's not a choice in the sense that it's not, a, it's not something I'm putting into the model. It is, it is a feature of the model that... that well, no, it's not even a feature of the model. It's, so, okay, working within the context of the pi of model, it is, it is a feature. But it's not something I put in by hand. It's fundamental to the model. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but is you suggesting that the, what's grayed out now, these hadrons yeah. do not bind to leading order via pi and Exactly, exchange. yeah. I'll generalize this a bit later and I'll deal with that. So, I mean, at the start you can see, okay, well, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to explain all of this stuff here by restricting to these possibilities. But it's a good place to start for a reason that I'll explain. So, I'm just going to look at this problem now for the first few minutes and then I'll come back to the other channels later. Um, so, I restrict the spectrum then. So the form of the sorry the form of the of the binding potential looks like this. We have a central and tensor potential. Those of you who remember nuclear physics will know all about this. And we have a spin dependent term, a tensor term, and these are the flavor dependence. This is the flavor dependence here contained in this T dot T operator. Okay, all of this is is very model independent now, apart from assumptions that go into these things, which I'm not going to discuss in great detail, but I can talk about later if you wish. So the key thing in determining which states bind and which states don't bind are these angular momentum dependent factors, which I've highlighted here. So I've considered, for example, the combination of a sigma C and a D star, and I'm coupling them to either spin half and spin three halves. Okay, there are many different combinations. I'll just give you one example here. And this pair of particles can then be an S wave or D wave in two different combinations. And so we have a potential problem, which is a matrix problem to solve. It's a coupled channel potential problem. These coefficients in this matrix are, 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 are very robust in the sense that they're fixed by the heavy quark symmetry. There's no ambiguity in those. There is some ambiguity in the potentials but the coefficients are fixed, and they're the most important thing. Okay. The central and tensor potentials, that, there is a bit of model de dependence there, in the sense that we have to take account of the fact that the hadrons are not point particles. If they were, everything would be easy, but hadrons are, have some size, and we parameterize that using a form factor. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, this factor here is extremely model independent, okay? And this factor tells us, this depends on the isospin, so this tells us that the larger the isospin, the weaker the potential. This is something which is scarcely appreciated at all in the literature. It's very model independent, okay? So, if I take different combinations of these particles, because they have isospin one or isospin half, I can make total isospin one half or isospin three halves. But the isospin three halves combinations are always smaller by a factor of half with a negative sign than the isospin one half. 
So a generic feature of the pion exchange model is that it's hard to make bound states with eyes and spin three halves, which is not true of the compact pentaquark approach. A key observation is that where there are channels which can combine into S wave, the binding or otherwise is really determined by this number here, this coefficient. It's the coefficient of the S wave channel and it depends on the size of that number and whether it's positive or negative. And roughly speaking, if it's negative, it means the potential is attractive. So you have the potential to get bound states. Even if the number is positive, you can get bound states, but the bound states then form really due to the coupled channel nature of this problem, but not because of the, the central potential. So it's easier to make bound states when that number there is negative. I'm going to remind you that those numbers are model independent. So I now do the calculation. Uh, because I have a matrix problem here, essentially, you can actually get bound states almost anywhere you wish by increasing the strength of the potential. So the question is really not, can you get a bound state that will fit the data? The question is, how many bound states can you, well, firstly, are the parameters that you need in order to get a bound state natural? And secondly, um, once you fix those parameters, how many states do you get and do they fit with the experiment? So I do the calculation here uh, where I vary the strength of the potential and this only reflects the fact that there's a little bit of wiggle room in the parameters. Okay? The parameters are essentially fixed by the decays of hadrons but there's a little bit of flexibility there because it's all a model and you know, the, everything doesn't line up quite perfectly. So I vary the strength of the potential and then I change the form factor, which is the one aspect of the calculation which is really model dependent. I vary the form factor until I get a bound state. Okay, and the first thing I do is I calculate the deuteron. I fix my parameters by calculating the deuteron and I see that as I make the potential, so this curve here is the so-called critical form factor. This is my term for the minimum value of the form factor that's needed in order to get a bound state in a given channel. As you increase the form factor, you will eventually get a bound state. But the question is, what value do you need in order to make that happen? So as the potential gets stronger, I need a smaller form factor to get a bound state. In other words, it's easier to make a bound state. So I normalise my results to the deuteron, and I then calculate the critical form factor for all of these other combinations. In other words, I increase the form factor until I get a bound state. Okay, for all the different values of the strength of the potential. And these are what the curves look like. So, a low, a low position on this graph, briefly speaking, means it's easy to make a bound state. Okay, the fact that these lines don't intersect indicates that it doesn't matter what the strength of the potential is, the pattern is the same. Okay, it's easiest to make a state with spin five halves with a sigma C star and a D star. The next most easy state has got spin three halves, a combination of sigma C and D star, and so on, all the way up. Okay, so there are five possibilities. These are the, this is what you find for eyes and spin one half combinations. And I remarked before that it's always harder to make states with eyes and spin three halves. So this is, this is the plot for the eyes and spin three half states. It's harder to make bound states with eyes of spin three halves. So the way I want you to read this plot is the easiest states to make are these ones down here. Okay? And I'll show you in square brackets the coefficient of the term of the S wave contribution to the potential, which I explained was really critical in determining which states bind and which states don't. Okay? Here we have a, a large negative coefficient. It's easy to bind this state. Another negative coefficient, not quite as large, still easy to bind it, but not quite as easy, and so on. Until you get to states where the central potential, the S-wave potential, is actually repulsive, it has the wrong sign, but you can still make a bound state. It's just much harder. So these are the states that emerge most naturally. So the binding comes from the tensor quantity. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Just like with the deuteron, it was critical. So in looking at this problem, I start with so the five possibilities that I had are the five red lines here. 
these five possibilities, one, two, three, four, five, if I look only at the states which have got an attractive potential, I only get left with two, and one of these fits very nicely with one of these pentaclase. So this other state, which is the most easy to bind, should be there, but there's actually a natural reason why this is not, ex not seen in the experiment, which is that this state couples to J psi and a proton, the decay channel, only in a D wave, which is a suppressed decay. So we would expect in principle two states, but the absence of one of them has a natural explanation. Let me just skip over this and explore what happens if we generalise this picture a little bit. First, some remarks about production. So how would these things be produced? Well, they're produced in the weak decay uh, of a lambda B hadron. Okay, and there are various different topologies here which are possible. This is the leading topology. This is the so-called Kabibo favoured diagram where the weak decay produces a charm strange meson okay, on its own. These are could be both suppressed decays where the, the produced charm and strange part end up in different hadrons. So the leading diagrams are the ones involving uh, lambda C states. So this, is a, this would be a lambda C here. The message of this is on the production side, it's much easier to make lambda C flavoured hadrons. I won't go into the details of this. I just want to explore the implications of what happens when I move from this simplified, restricted picture to the bigger picture where I look at all of the combinations. So if I now look at all of the combinations, and I'm not going to give you the details of the calculation now, but just give you some simple arguments. If I try to do the full coupled channel problem now, where I allow all of these channels to mix, where would I expect to see states? And do they fit? Do they fit with the observations? So let me start at, at the bottom. Would I expect to see a state here? Okay, so I've shown in red here all of the states that this channel couples to due to the exchange of a pion. It can't couple to itself because a lambda C cannot couple to a lambda C, but it can couple to a sigma C, and the D can couple to a D star, but there's a very large gap here. And the larger the gap means, the weaker the, the coupling effect. So it's very natural that we wouldn't have anything at this threshold. And this is supported by actual calculation. Okay, moving up now to the next combination, let me look at this, the lambda C D star. And I'll show you now the channels that it can couple to. So the lambda C can, in particular, turn into a sigma C, and a D star can turn into a D. So here we have, and, and, and there are other channels available as well. So here we have two thresholds which are very close, and close thresholds mean the coupling can be very important. Okay, so in a sense it's very natural then that we see a state emerging at this threshold. The other thing is, as I remarked before, on the production side, the production side strongly favours hadrons with lambda C's in them. So that's a sort of indication that particles made of combinations of lambda C, and particles with a lambda C component, are going to be strongly produced in this experiment. Moving further up now, looking at the spin three halves combination. So here I can't make the same argument on the production side, but there are at least a number of channels available, for example, around this mass, okay, where this particle can couple to all of these different channels. And, and calculations, not only my own, but by other authors, indicate that it is possible to get a state around, around here, which is a coupled channel state, mix of all of these things. Uh, and then finally, looking at spin five halves, I have the state that I was discussing before as being the one which is preferentially most easy to bind, okay, but there's no evidence for this state. Now, I had an argument before why this state hasn't been seen, because it can't easily decay to J psi and proton, but I now have an ar another argument why it can't be seen. On the production side, production favours states with the lambda C components, and this state cannot, cannot couple to any states with the lambda C. Okay, there's no lambda C D combination, which has got spin five halves. So it's hard, although this state likes to bind, it's very hard to produce this state and it's hard for it to, de to, de to decay into the observed channel. 
So there's a sort of a picture emerging where it's natural that there would be a state here and a state here and one of these states. I want to finally just address why is it that there could be two states here? What I call the new, and remember this used to be one state and it's now two. So this is a new puzzle. Why are there two states here? Okay. Because I argued before, it's natural really to just have one state there. Why would there be two? So my previous argument was we get binding in this channel naturally. That could explain one state, but not two. But there's one thing I've been ignoring all the way through here, which is this channel here, which is extremely close, amazingly close. And this has not been discussed at all in the literature. Well, it was proposed by me in a paper a, while, a few years ago, but the calculation I haven't done until, until recently, I'm doing it with Eric Swanson, my collaborator. The very fact that this channel is so extremely close these two channels are so extremely close, and they do couple by pi on exchange. This is a strong indication that this channel could be playing a role. And if you have more degrees of freedom, it's natural that you could potentially expect more bound states. An interesting fact about, about this guy, the lambda C1, is it's a P wave state, which means its parity is opposite to all of the others. This is a very peculiar thing about this system. Normally, P wave states are quite a lot heavier. Okay, but in this system, the lambda C P wave is only about 140 MeV heavier than, than the sigma C, the sigma C uh, hadron. So that's why these thresholds line up. It's quite a peculiar feature. So what role does this have? Well, the potential I showed you before, in this kind of this sort of diagonal potential where I ignore mixing between particles, well, not only when I ignore it, but just as an example where I'm showing uh, not mixing particles, the sigma C goes to sigma C D star to sigma C D star. It's got this central term and the tensor term. This is a very familiar form from the literature. This lambda C1 state, because of the opposite parity, the nature of the potential that it produces in this binding problem is very different. Instead of a central and tensor term, you have a so-called vector term, which is much less familiar, probably why it's never been dealt with in the literature before. It's connected with the fact that it has opposite parity. So whereas, whereas these potentials essentially correspond to a P wave emission of a particle, this corresponds to an S wave. Anyway, it doesn't particularly matter. What's very interesting from a phenomenology point of view is because this state has got opposite parity to all of the other counterparts, it all of a sudden means that we can predict, we would expect actually states with opposite parity, molecular states with opposite parity. So let me combine now for you the different uh, combinations of sigma C's and D stars and lambda C1 with D's. Okay, these are the two thresholds that line up. The S wave combination with spin half I already said was unbound, there's no state there. The three halves combination with with S waves for the sigma C D star. That is the one that is naturally associated with one of these states. And then there's this new possibility, which is interesting. We could have a spin half positive parity state, which nonetheless has got an S wave component. And that's because this lambda C1 has got opposite parity. Okay, and we do the calculation. I'm not showing you the details. We do the calculation. We see indeed it's very natural. We do get another bound state here, which most naturally is associated with this uh, additional pentaquark, this 4440. So by coupling these two thresholds in different quantum number combinations, I can, with natural parameters, uh, explain both of these. I think I'll skip this because I can see that I am out of time. So I had some brief remarks which I'll just mention in the in the conclusions. So the first the first remark is really that I haven't made a big deal of, deal of it in this talk, but it is an important point, which is that the two different approaches out there in the literature, the quark models and Lagrangians based on heavy quark and chiral symmetry, actually give the same potential. And proponents of the heavy quark symmetry approach generally have a slightly more um, uh, holier-than-now approach. Um, 
because the, the fundamental principles are, are un, undeniably better than the principles of the quark model. But at the end of the day, they, they go to the static limit, at which point all the beautiful Dirac structure just disappears and they, get, and they end up with the same, the same potential. And, and the, the quark model approach, by the way, is 10 times easier to use and more direct. So um, that's my little rant. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, uh, it, but really the point for this talk is that they're the same. It doesn't matter what, what approach you use, you get the same result, apart from a little bit of freedom in parameters. But really my point is, the, param the freedom in parameters is, is not really that important to this kind of analysis because what is robust is the pattern, which states bind, which states don't bind, and that pattern is not sensitive to the parameters. In particular, the patterns of which states bind and which states don't bind uh, can actually be quite easily understood in terms of these model independent factors which just come from the spin and the ISO spin. Same factors in both approaches. Um, in this analysis, I do see one state which fits naturally with one of the pentaquarks. I see another one which is not observed, but there's a reason it's not observed, which is it doesn't decay strongly into the final state that experiment looks at. And there's also this aspect that on the production side, production favours the lambda C, channels with the lambda Cs in them. Um, so that supports the fact that, that this state, which doesn't have a lambda C component, is not seen. And it also actually fits with the observations of these other lighter, newer pentaquark states, which line up where there are a couple of channel thresholds. It all sort of hangs together quite nicely. A really important point about this, this is my final slide, is that the spectrum of states you get out of this exercise is, is restricted. Um, and the spin and parity quantum numbers are also quite unambiguous. Okay, there are a lot of possibilities before you do a calculation, and then you do the calculation, you look at the numbers and the patterns, and you see, okay, there's the various combinations which work and which don't work. In particular, the heaviest, narrowest state fits as a sigma C D star molecule. That's the one I obtained in the simpler analysis. And then I switched on the coupling to this other channel so that we'll have a small component in this wave function. The really novel prediction is that the state which is just below it should have opposite parity. That's something which doesn't appear in any other models really in the literature. And that is a, a state built of lambda C1 and a D bar with again a bit of this orthogonal mixture here. And then there's the lower broad state which lines up nicely with this threshold. That will only work if it's got spin three halves. Uh, and finally, the lower mass state, again, will only work if, if the state's observed to have spin one half. Uh, I'll talk about ISO spin in a second. So it's important to say that the compact pentaquark scenario actually predicts lots and lots more states than this, with all possible ISO spins, ISO spin half, ISO spin three halves, and all possible spins and parities. Okay, and moreover, the masses of the states in those models are very model, model dependent, model dependent, and not correlated with thresholds in any way. So this approach has a much tighter set of predictions, which can be falsified by experiment. The final thing I didn't have time to say is that because all of these things are close to thresholds, and the thresholds, the relevant thresholds, uh, consist of different charge combinations of hadrons like lambda C plus D naught, lambda C plus plus D minus. These different threshold, different charge combinations have got different masses, which leads to a breaking of isospin. So these states will all actually be states of mixed isospin, which has experimental consequences, which in principle could be, could be tested uh, and is another, another uh, distinguishing feature compared to the compact pentaquark scenario. So that's it, I'll stop there. Any questions? Please.
states are all unstable, obviously. Yeah. So, how is this reflected when you when you talk about potentials? Um, yeah. So, assuming the yeah the, the model that they have in their lifetime or well, kind of large life. Uh, so, it yes and no. So, in the very simplified approach that I started with where I ignored the fact that the particles could mix with other particles. So in that approach, they are stable particles because they can't couple to anything else. So they're really bound, genuinely bound states which, which can't, can't decay, which is an approximation. When I go to the full couple, which is obviously not, not true in nature, as you identified, they're, they're unstable, they decay. Um, when, you, when you go to the full coupled channel problem, then the particles can decay because they can couple to lower mass combinations of particles. How that gets manifest is that the potential become, acquires an imaginary part, um, which then, in principle, gives you the width of the state. Now, actually, those calculations then do become quite intricate and difficult because you then have a... Um, you're then really studying resonances, which is quite a messy thing to do in the Schrodinger equation. So that's why I'm using sort of simpler arguments here rather than, than um, showing you calculations. But I have done the couple channel calculation, uh, and, and more ambiguities and mess comes in, but I've done the cu couple channel calculation there where you allow the particles to decay, and the way I do it is by solving the Schrodinger equation in a box and then vary the size of the box. And you look at the way the levels evolve as the box size changes and you see these stabilization regions which correspond to resonances. So where the resonances are narrow, which is to say long life particles, this works beautifully. When they start getting broader, it starts getting quite a little hard to interpret these diagrams, but nonetheless the 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 observations are consistent with the, the simple arguments that I gave you. Um, none of the calculations I've done include the coupling to the James site proton, which is where the states are actually observed, but in principle one could do that. But um, I'm not sure if anyone has done that, but it's that coupling influences the decay, but is not, I think, expected to influence largely whether or not the state binds. Okay, thanks. But once falsified and verified your model, will you give back some information to the original work model that you can already foresee from? Um, uh, maybe. I mean, so one th if you look at... If you look at diagrams like... Perhaps. So if you look at diagrams like this, if you can really fill out the patterns of these particles and really look at the families of particles like the diagrams I showed you at the start of my talk, if you could really do that, then that would then give you some constraint on the parameters, particularly the form factor, which is something that corresponds to the size of the hadron. And then once you fix that, you can then look at molecular type states with other combinations of hadrons instead of baryons and mesons, for example, baryons and baryons, mesons and mesons. Once, once you have more information there, you have more constraints on the parameters, you can make predictions for other particles. So not for the, the moment, but for the future decision. Yeah, yeah. I would say the first thing would be establishing whether or not the, the quantum numbers are consistent with the picture. And the other thing is, of course, I've only considered the exchange of pions here. In principle, you can, then, you can exchange anything that's consistent with the quantum numbers, there's a good reason to consider only pylons, but you can make the model more complicated by exchanging vector, you know, rows and eaters and everything. Uh, but then you lose this sort of simplicity, which is, I think, the stage that we're at with this whole exercise. Uh, <coughs> so is there any chance of any other experiments confirming these states? Because, I mean, usually to get it in the particle data, you have to have two experiments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, although these ones seem to have snuck in very quickly into the particle data. Book. So even, even with just one experiment? Yeah, they, they, they're there. The, 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 previous, the results of the previous experiment are in the, in the particle data book. So you see a state there, PC4450, which is the one that's now become two particles. 
Anyway, um, are there other experiments? Yeah, well, the other, the main one that I um, am aware of is um, one of the Jefferson Lab experiments, which I've forgotten about, which is photo production. Because if if you have a a, a state that decays to J psi and a proton, well, because the J psi is a vector particle, it means in principle you could also produce the state with a with a photon coupling to a proton. Right. So they they are looking Jefferson Lab. I can't remember the name of the experiment, but they are looking in photo production. So. Um, well, I guess in the future it will be, but there's one experiment I think right now that's actually working. And I have heard rumours that they don't see these things. Um, but that's just a rumour, and anyway, if they don't, that's useful experimental information. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. 